So the next method that we're going to write um, is to help output some, some data that we're going to calculate. So not only is our program going to encrypt the text, so if we run our program and we specify that our message is attack the enemy army from the east at dawn, not only will that get encrypted, but also based on our estimate of how many seconds it's going to take the enemy army to guess a passphrase and see if it actually decrypts correctly or not, we're going to calculate on average um, how long will it take the enemy army to crack the cipher. Now this could end up being a really big number, right? So that we could end up with like, I don't know, maybe we end up with like 4 billion seconds, okay? Um, I can't wrap my head around 4 billion seconds. I don't know if that's a long time or not. It sounds like a pretty big number, um, but so does 250,000 seconds. That sounds like a pretty big number. So this method here is going to print the average time to crack, but it's going to print it in um, units that make more sense to us. So like, like how many years are we talking about? How many days are we talking about? Things like that. So let's write the method header first, and then we'll write the Java doc comment um, such that it's documented. So this method is going to be public. This method, like our main method, is also going to be static. And we're going to actually focus on more depth in a moment here. What do we really mean when we say a method is static? We've been making all of our main methods static, but we haven't really... What's the implications of that? So public static void is not going to return a value. Um, print average time to crack. Because maybe we are dealing with billions of seconds, we're going to actually use a long here to represent total seconds. And then this method will actually print out a nice uh, converted numbers and units that make sense to us. So let's add in the Java doc. So slash star star enter and describe what it is this method's going to do. So this method formats the average time to crack the cipher based on the specified number of seconds and displays via system.out. So it's going to actually print the, all these messages. But it's going to display via system.out in several formats to help us better understand what we're talking about here. So while we're here documenting this, let's focus a little bit on the use of the word static. So we've, we've seen public static void main methods. We seem to always have one of those for our programs. Um, when we did the turtle lab, or the turtle demo rather, we had a static method called make awesome turtle program, but we never really explored what static means. So let's, let's do that now. So this method is static. What's that mean? Well, therefore, because it's static, it is independent, independent of the state of a Caesar cipher object. At a high level, conceptually, that's what static means in Java. Static means that this, in this case, this method is independent of the state of any particular Caesar cipher object. So it's not, it's not related to a particular object. It's not necessarily called on any Caesar cipher object. Um, what this means, so I guess as a result, this is why we do it, as a result, this method may be invoked on the class instead of a variable that references an object. What do I mean by invoked on a class? Well, we'd actually have the class name Caesar Cipher dot print average time to crack. And whatever that value is. We've seen this once before. When we were highlight, highlighting the coin class, there's a line of code that we were parsing that said math.random. And it was odd because we're used to seeing methods called on variables that reference objects, but we inferred based on our syntax clues that math, since it started with a capital letter, 
was a class. So here we were calling a, a method on a class and we hadn't seen that before. That method was static, just like this print average time to crack method is static. This is useful when it doesn't really make sense to have an object to call the method. Um, this is analogous to calling just a function in Python. Right? When you just call a regular function in Python, there is no object involved. It's not a method. Um, generating a random number from the math class is, is such a thing. You don't really need to create an ob you don't need to create a math object to do that. What would that even mean if we said new math? Like what what does that object represent? Um, we'll see later this chapter that every method of the math class is static. We'll never need to create a new math object. Um, if you find yourself writing tons and tons of static methods, you're probably not approaching your, 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 your program from an object-oriented perspective. You're probably approaching it more from a procedural perspective that you may be accustomed to from like programming one or something. Um, so so watch, out, watch out for that. In our program, sometimes we write static methods because we're just exploring a little concept. Um, but in our bigger programs, we usually don't have any static methods um, other than the main method that gets the whole program running in the first place. There is a limitation of a static method. Because a static method is independent of the state of any particular object, because we can call it right on the class and we don't even need an object, um, here's, the, here's the restriction. So in addition to this behavior, um, this method cannot access any instance variables instance variables. Which if you think about it kind of makes sense. If we don't call this method on an object then we certainly there's no object for us to look up the value of any given instance variable. So if we had a static method on the turtle class that static method wouldn't have access to the turtle's color or position or orientation because there's no turtle object right um, or you know even if there are a hundred turtle objects created elsewhere in the program which, which turtle's color do you want? Um, you didn't call the method on a turtle object. Now static methods can be called on variables that reference objects, but even when that's done, they still cannot access any instance variables. They still behave in this way. All right, let's add our app param tag before we forget for the Java doc. Total seconds. Um, it is the average number of seconds to crack the cipher. Cool. So inside this method, and this, this we'll work on it a little bit today, we'll work on it a little bit more tomorrow, um, we're going to need to do lots of conversions. Because we're going to need to convert the total number of seconds and we're going to say like, okay, well, how many how many minutes is that, and how many hours is that, and how many days is that, and how many years is that? So we have lots of like mathematical conversions to do here, and a lot of constants to use because there's 60 seconds in a minute, um, and there's 60 minutes in an hour, and 24 hours in a day, and all this type of stuff. Uh, it may be tempting for us just to start writing this code and doing these calculations. And if we were to do so, our method would end up literal, littered with integer literals, numbers like 60 and 24 and 365. Um, and that's potentially problematic for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it makes it often harder to read our code because as we read through it, unless we look at the calculation being performed, we're not sure what that number represents. Like, why are we dividing by 60? Um, is that 60 representing seconds in a minute or minutes in an hour like it's not clear unless I look closely at the code. Um, it also is a potential issue from a maintenance point of view which is what if we need to change something here we have to look at every 60 in the code figure out which ones deal with seconds and which ones deal with minutes and change one and not the other that's a problem. So literal um, integer literals or just literals in general sprinkled throughout a method are called magic numbers. Um, in that we don't necessarily, without looking carefully, we don't know what the numbers are. They're just magic and they seem to make the code work. We don't want to use those. Um, <coughs> what we're going to do instead is we're going to define a constant. 
And this is the syntax for the constant. Um, we're going to use this keyword final, which we'll define in just a moment. And we'll say this constant is of type int. And we're going to use our convention for constants, which is all capital letters um, and underscores between words. Seconds for every minute. And we'll set it equal to 60. That's how we do a constant. And we'll do slash star enter and document exactly how this, this works. So instead of using a magic number, <coughs> for example, a magic number could be 3.14159. Instead of using a magic number, we should always use constants defined either by us, like seconds for every minute, um, or by the Java standard library. For example, here's a good example, like don't hard code pies. That's already defined. So for example, in the capital M math class is defined public static final double pi equals 3.14159265. There you go. So we shouldn't hard code the number 3.14159. We should use the constant pi that's already been defined in the math class. Um, when we read the code and you see some calculation and it says pi instead of a number, it just makes it easier for whoever's reading your code to know what's going on. In the last unit, we learned the convention that constants should be all capital letters and separated by underscores, the word separated by underscores. In this unit, we're learning that we should also use the keyword final. Okay, um, So we are going to declare a constant with the final keyword. And then just a reminder that by convention, constants are in all caps with underscores. So the convention is just that, a convention. If, if, some, if someone wants to change seconds for every minute and change it to 30, like just making it capital letters doesn't prevent anyone from doing that. But the final keyword does prevent anyone from doing that. So let me show you what happens if we try to change this. If we try to change the value, a compiler error will be generated. Let's try. So seconds for every minute, we set to 30. Right? Does not compile. Cannot assign a value to final variable seconds for every minute. That's a really nice compiler error. It's fairly descriptive. Um, so we can't do that. The compiler will enforce the fact that it's a constant. Um, for me personally, I used to find the keyword final odd. I think that was because I was more familiar with other programming languages that would use something like const, short for constant. Um, but I, I, I think I finally figured it out. I shifted my perspective, and I think of the final keyword now as saying, this is the final value for this variable. So when we say final in seconds for every minute equals 60, this is the final value we will assign to this variable. We cannot do it again. And so when I think about it that way, final makes, makes sense. Um, and I don't get confused anymore. So I'm going to comment this out so our code still compiles. Uh, and we're going to need, we're going to need some more constants. Um, we're going to need three more constants. So let's, let's do all the other conversion factors we need at this point. So we need minutes for every hour, and there's 60 minutes in an hour. We need hours for every day. There's 24 of those. And we need days for every year. We're not going to worry about leap days and 
leap seconds, and we're going to have a very simplified view of time. Um, until I wrote software that, that worked with some of the protocols for global positioning satellites, I had no idea how complicated time was. We, yeah, it, it's amazing. Um, we're going to keep it super simple. Before we go off and write the code to actually do all these conversions, I want to pause and give you some time uh, with your partner to, to practice this idea of um, magic, getting rid of magic numbers. Ah, but actually, before we do that, there's, there's one other thing I wanted that I glossed over that I want to go back and address. So these, these constants are scoped within this method print average time to crack. So they're constants because they're final. Um, other than that, they're still like regular local variables. They're just constants. They're final. Um, in the example I referenced here for the math class, it not only was pi final, which is good. We don't want anyone changing the value of pi. It was also static. And so I want to touch briefly on what does it mean when a variable is static. So if you scroll up to the top of this file, I actually already had written and included in here a variable which is private, meaning no other classes can access this variable alphabet. It's static as well as being final, so it's constant, it can't be changed. We don't want anyone to redefine the letters in the alphabet. But let's take a moment just to capture what we mean by static in the case of this, this variable. So slash star enter for another comment block. Here's what we mean by static for a variable. Conceptually, it's the same as with the method. A static method is scoped to the entire class. It doesn't relate to any one particular object. A static variable is the same thing. A static variable has one value for the variable for all objects of the class. This may help you, um, connected to something else you're familiar with. This is like class attributes in Python. Okay, if you're familiar with class attributes in Python, static class variables are exactly the same thing. So ignoring for a moment that alphabet here is final, what I mean by there's only one value for all objects of the class, if we had a dozen different Caesar cipher objects, they would all, re when they referenced alphabet, it would be the same value for all 12 objects. If one of those objects changed the value of alphabet, all other 11 objects would see the new changed value. Okay, um, So it's not like, going back to our physical model, it's not like on that sheet of paper, each different object gets its own space to write a value for the instance variable. Rather, think of it as more like a reference such that there's only one place where the value of alphabet is stored. And all the objects of the class reference that one place. Okay, um, That might seem strange, but sometimes it's really useful. And it's certainly useful in cases like this when not only is it static, but it's also final. It's a constant. So <coughs> we've been using these since the very first week of school, but maybe didn't quite realize, probably didn't realize until now, what exactly was going on. So static class variables can be accessed directly through the class. So we could say something like Caesar cipher dot alphabet. We can also say things like math dot pi. That's how we would reference the constant pi. And as I alluded to, since the very first week of school, we've been saying things like color dot red. So when we say color dot red, which has always been kind of weird, we, have, um, we know color is a class. We know red is a variable and specifically a constant because it's in all caps. But now what red is, it's a public, static, final, class variable of the color class. Right? Final makes sense for red. We don't want someone to change what 
color red is on us all of a sudden. Um, and it's static because we don't want to have to like create a color object just to get at the red color object. Um, that would be kind of weird, so static fits it well. So when we say color.red, we're referencing that class variable. We're referencing a static final variable of the color class. Um, so hopefully that helps fill in that little gap that we've been ignoring until now. The other thing that's new with this line of code is in the entire first unit, every time we dealt with a string, I would write something like alphabet equals new string parenthesis double quote. And I put the characters in there. I didn't do that here. Um, what I'm using instead here is what is called a string literal. A string literal um, is an instance of the string class. It is not a primitive. So yesterday we focused on primitive literals. True, false, 43, 3.14, A in single quotes. Okay. This is a literal, but it's a string literal. It's not a primitive literal. It is the only class that has literals in Java. Strings are kind of special in Java. Um, it is an instance of the string class. It is not a primitive. It is delineated by double quotes. We always use double quotes to make it. Um, and it must be defined on a single line. So in Python, you can do like that triple quote thing, or triple double quote thing. Mm, Java doesn't have anything like that. We got to put our string literals on a single line. And what I mean by it's an instance of the string class is when I say alphabet equals double quote, A, B, C, D, whatever, that string in double quotes is a string literal, and it's equivalent to it's just like I wrote new string parenthesis double quote in the string. It's the same as that. In the first unit, I wanted to be consistent. I wanted to show you that every time we created a new object, we said like variable equals new class name, crush equals new turtle, my name equals new string parenthesis double quote, um, new rectangle, right? New random. Um, I think we've got that figured out now. I think we're pretty comfortable with that. So now I wanted to show you, hey, there is a shortcut. We can imply the whole new string part by just using a string literal. This only works for strings. We can't do this with any other class. Just strings are special. All right. Let's pause here.